In an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and that nothing was true. The totalitarian mass leaders based their propaganda on the correct psychological assumption that under some conditions, one could make people believe the most fantastic statements one day and trust that if the next day they were given irrefutable proof of their falsehood, they would take refuge in cynicism. Fake news in a post-truth world. To demonstrate the severity of the problem, just yesterday, David Brooks of the New York Times cited the fact that, according to the National Science Foundation, 44% of 18 to 24-year-olds say astrology is somewhat or very scientific. Add to this the current alarm bells set off by the latest cover of Newsweek, which is pretty shocking. Despite the fact that we all know the Earth is round, the flat Earth movement is growing. In 2019, with all our advanced technology, and maybe in part because of it, False ideas are spreading fast and furiously around the globe. People no longer know what to believe and are apparently beginning to grasp at ridiculous straws. George Orwell would be laughing, of course, but wryly. I'm Mary Stack, the director of Cambridge Forum, and tonight we're going to wrangle with this huge problem in an attempt to demystify it, to examine how we got here, and consider how and if we can get out of our current quagmire. When I checked Wikipedia, it defined fake news websites as, quote, deliberately publishing hoaxes, propaganda, and disinformation to drive web traffic inflamed by social media. One pan-European news outlet on Wikipedia went further, describing the proliferation of fake news as a form of psychological warfare. So this is serious stuff the kind of things that causes wars. And remember, it was already costing us an election, which is deliberately influenced by Russian infiltration. Tonight, we are fortunate to have with us Lee McIntyre from BU Center for Philosophy and History of Science. He's an expert in both post-truth and pseudoscience, and he's written two books on these two topics. McIntyre, who also wrote the latest Newsweek cover story, alerts us to the fact that the science denier industry is busier than ever spreading misinformation, some would just say plain lies, about climate change, vaccines, so forth. To help us understand how we reach this alternative universe where fantasies replace hard facts and opinions carry more weight than scientific evidence, and to try and explain how and if we can push back I am delighted to introduce Lee McIntyre. I brought two books here with me. One is a copy of Post Truth, but the other is my childhood copy of George Orwell's 1984, which I'm carrying around more and more uh, these days. And I quote from it extensively in, the, in my book. So my talk tonight is called Fake News Versus Facts, Living in a Post-Truth World. The problem of fake news is well known. It's not a new phenomena and surely goes back at least to the yellow journalism of the 1890s and probably before. But it's been in the news so much in the last two years that people may think that they know what it is, even if they do not. In a recent book, I had quite a bit to say, both about the historical roots and insidious effects of fake news, uh, with a particular focus on the problems that it created in the 2016 presidential election. Tonight, I want to zero in on one of its more long-lasting collateral effects, which is the danger it poses to freedom of the press and thus to democracy. The role of fake news in influencing the 2016 presidential election in the USA is well known. As foreign meddlers and other parties created false and misleading content, then spread it on social media through Facebook and other platforms, the public became confused over what was true and what was false? Which sources were reliable? Who could be trusted anymore? As fake news stories competed with real news stories, 
We saw how easy it was to manipulate public opinion and the terrible cost this had, not only for trust in the media, but also for the role that the press must play in providing the kind of accurate information that's the lifeblood of living in a free society. Since the election, however, we've seen the term fake news become appropriated as a weapon against one's political opponents. During his first press conference on January 11, 2017, even before he was sworn in as president, Donald Trump refused to take a question from CNN reporter Jim Acosta saying, you are fake news. In February 2017, Trump tweeted that fake news was, quote, the enemy of the American people, end quote. In June 2018, after the press asked some hard questions about his preparation for the North Korean summit, Trump tweeted that, quote, the fake news, especially NBC and CNN, are fighting hard to downplay the deal with North Korea. Our country's biggest enemy is the fake news so easily promulgated by fools, end quote. This sort of attack on the mainstream press must be understood for what it is, which is a deliberate strategy to undermine the credibility of those who sometimes report information that's unflattering to the president. According to Jim Rosen, a journalism professor at New York University, quote, it's the erosion of the common world of fact. If we can't agree on what facts are, if there are no facts because they're in endless dispute, there's no accountability, end quote. As accusations of fake news are now being made against legitimate news organizations with no compelling evidence that their reporting is biased or even inaccurate, we can come to no other conclusion than that the term has been hijacked for use against news stories that go against the president's interests. Indeed, in recent months, it's become clear that Trump uses the term fake news for stories about him that are negative, whether they are false or not. And increasingly, his followers have begun to do the same. There was a recent poll which showed, I think, that 40% uh, uh, agreed with him that uh, uh, fake news were stories that were negative. In such an environment, the very idea of truth itself seems in danger of becoming partisan. Here it's important to be clear about the definition of fake news. Fake news is not news that's merely false. It's news that is intentionally false. In order to create fake news, one has to do so on purpose, with the goal of trying to get someone to believe something that is not true. In this sense, it's important to realize that just because a news story is mistaken, this does not mean that it's fake. Legitimate news organizations occasionally make mistakes or even publish information that's false, but this is not the same thing as creating or sharing fake news. In order for a news story to be fake, the people who created it would have to have the intention to mislead. They would have to be biased, underhanded, or have an agenda that's the journalistic equivalent of lying or malpractice. There's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. Just as stating a falsehood is not a lie unless one knows it to be untrue, writing a news story that's false is not fake unless its author does so with the intention to mislead. The fact that legitimate news organizations have a culture in which they are expected not only to follow good journalistic conventions, such as disclosing potential conflicts of interest, double sourcing information, fact checking, and then correcting any mistakes that may slip through, suggests that what they're up to is not fake at all. Even if one does not like what they say, neither this nor any occasional mistakes are sufficient for accusations of bias or fakery. In fact, in some ways, one might say that it's the job of journalists to expose facts that are against the interests of those in power. As George Orwell once said, quote, journalism is printing what someone else does not want printed. Everything else is public relations, end quote. The job of the media is first and foremost to tell the truth. This means that accusations of fake news when one knows or even suspects that such intentional dissimulation is not the motive, is itself a kind of fake news. To accuse journalists not merely of being inaccurate, but of being intentionally inaccurate, should carry a very high bar of proof. In fact, what this amounts to is saying that news organizations are engaged, are engaged in a kind of conspiracy to betray the values that they have sworn to uphold. 
In light of this, I ask you to consider which is more likely to be true, that there's a worldwide conspiracy of news organizations to obscure the truth about the U.S. national murder rate or whether the illegal border crossings have been down rather than up in the past decade, or whether the truth about these topics merely hurts the interests of those who are hurtling accusations of fake news. Of course, as we saw in the 2016 election, fake news does exist, and I don't mean anything I say here tonight to suggest that it should not be taken seriously. And we all saw examples of that, those of you who uh, ran across uh, in your Facebook or your Twitter feed things about Texas seceding from the Union. That was fake. Those were uh, created by Russian bots. In the same vein, we have to flush out and run to ground any false accusations of fake news as themselves the source of precisely what they're accusing their opponents of. Now, there are two potential harms that may come from the existence of fake news. There's the well-known disinformation effect that can happen when someone creates a news story that's deliberately false. But there's also a ricochet effect of causing someone to doubt a story that is not false. The first problem is that fake news can compete for attention with real news, causing us to make our decisions about many factors in human life, including voting, on a fraudulent factual basis. But the second problem is that spurious accusations of fake news can be used for the political purpose of getting us to doubt that there actually are any truth tellers left in the world, because every source is biased. This can cause us to overlook the presentation of truthful information. Sometimes doubt and confusion can be just as effective as lying in getting someone to believe a falsehood. This is a classic double effect. People can take fake news for real, but they can also take real news for fake. Both are harmful. Both can cause injury not just to the factual basis for our decisions, but also to the very values of truth and evidence that are necessary for the smooth functioning of a democratic society. Of course, there's a remedy for the first problem. We can attempt to verify the truth for ourselves. We can exercise skepticism and put a premium on fact-checking. In short, we can do the hard work of ferreting out which stories are fake so that we can discount them. But what about the second problem? What are our tools against that? The most important thing we can do to fight against the second danger of fake news, which, the, which is that it can cause us to be distrustful even of legitimate news sources, is simply to be awake to its danger. And we must understand the stakes. The accusation of fake news where there is none is intended to have a pernicious effect on truth tellers. And this is done with a dark political purpose. It's in the interest of autocratic governments, not just to lie to their citizens, but to create a culture of demoralization and distrust where they may come to doubt that there is any real distinction between truth and falsehood. In this way, the goal is not merely to mislead, but to make us cynical, to make us doubt the truth even when it's in front of our faces. And, and this serves the interest only of those who have something other than the truth that they want to peddle to us, which is a tried and true precursor to authoritarianism. As the renowned Holocaust scholar Hannah Arendt once warned, quote, the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, true and false, no longer exists, end quote. As Tim Snyder more recently put it in his wonderful book, On Tyranny, post-truth is pre-fascism. Just look at where we are in the world today. Accusations of fake news made by political figures in Western democracies are parroted by dictators around the world who want to silence journalists who spread truthful information that threatens their, their rule. And sadly, there are many examples of journalists who have been imprisoned or even killed by regimes that are threatened by truthful news coverage. Why would someone do this? If we look at world history, we see that regimes that have attempted to silence the truth tellers have done so precisely because it preserves their power to be able to lie with impunity to those who are being governed. 
Perhaps such a government doesn't expect anyone to believe its lies. But to have the power to lie and not to be challenged is the mark of true power. As Jason Stanley observes in his powerful book, How Propaganda Works, the point of propaganda is not to convince you. It's to show you who's boss. In such an environment, accountability is at risk of being replaced by despotism. I therefore think that the greater danger of fake news is not just the dissemination of falsehood, like we saw in the 2016 election, but the collateral effect that false accusations of fake news can be used to prepare the ground for a culture of lying that serves the interest of those who seek to mislead the governed. A populace that is cynical and dispirited is easier to rule than one that is skeptical and awake. As the Trumpian response to this ricochet effect has now devolved to the tactic of threatening to rescind the broadcast licenses of those media outlets that the president would deem fake news, and to, quote, loosen the libel laws, there's a scary phrase, against all media outlets, we see all too clearly the nature of the threat that post-truth poses for freedom of the press and even for democracy itself. The danger of the post-truth tactic of fake news is not merely one of violence to the truth, but toward the values that are necessary for the preservation of political freedom in a fair and open society. How will these threats look in the face of future technological advancement? What's the future of fake news? So now I'm going to scare you even more. If the previous part of my talk wasn't scary enough, hang on. Unfortunately, we have no reason to suppose that things will improve anytime soon. While it's true that Facebook, Twitter, and other social media platforms are now making an effort to be more vigilant in, front, in confronting the problem of fake news, they may already be fighting the last war. As the saying goes, if you build a 10-foot wall, somebody's going to build an 11-foot ladder. Instead of simple text or picture-based content, the latest development on the horizon involves what are called deep fakes, which are manipulated audio and video content so realistic and fast emerging that within the next two years, we may not be able to tell with the naked eye or ear what's genuine and what's altered. I just heard on NPR on the way over today that, the, uh, that Congress is having a hearing tomorrow on deep fake uh, in the, uh, the House Intelligence Committee. So if you want to see examples of it, you can watch that. On the audio front, there's a Canadian company called Lyrebird that's developing a technology to allow a one-minute audio sample of someone's voice to be turned into a universal dictionary. This means that in principle, one can get the speaker to say anything one wants. Legitimate uses might involve restoring the voices of those who suffer from ALS or other debilitating illnesses so that their computer-assisted speech devices would no longer sound so robotic. But obviously, this technology may also be used for nefarious purposes as well. While the technology is not yet perfect, who here believes that it won't be improved someday? and perhaps become so widespread that it becomes available not only to the medical professionals who would use it for good purposes, but also to scammers and to politicians who wish to mislead us. Even more chilling, what might happen when such audio manipulation is married to cutting-edge video technology, such as that being developed in a project at Stanford University called Face to Face, which allows for the possibility of something called face capture, Think here of photoshopping not just a single image, but an entire video. And the scary part is it can be done in real time. Until now, one of the telltale signs that a piece of audio has been manipulated is that we can see on video if the person's mouth doesn't quite match up with their speech. But through face capture technology, we've reached the day when a stand-in wearing a mask standing just off stage is capable of altering the facial expressions of any speaker that's projected on a video screen. And again, this can all be done in real time. We're here far beyond any concerns over whether a piece of text or picture has been faked. Soon, and I think in time for the 2020 election, we'll be able to put the two innovations together 
and alter the video projection of a lecture or a speech to get the speaker to say anything that we would like. Imagine the ricochet effect. Imagine the possibilities. Just last week, instead of a clumsily shown video that was slowed down, that made it appear that Nancy Pelosi was drunk or stumbling, we could simply fake it. Instead of having to maintain that we did not call Meghan Markle nasty, when there's video evidence to the contrary, we could put out an alternative video with that phrase deleted and our mouth altered, then question which video was real and which one was fake. We can now appreciate the enormity of the challenge in fighting future disinformation. So far, one of the best tools for fighting fake news has been to compare what's written or seen with other factual accounts, such as videotape of a politician's speech, which serves as evidence of what really happened. But what might happen when audio or video evidence is no longer trusted as a fact check because the existence of deep fake technology calls into question the authenticity of the evidential source? One can already hear the conspiracy theorist rant that everything could be fake. Indeed, this has already happened. When confronted with an audio recording of him making a series of disgusting remarks about women's bodies on the Access Hollywood tape, then-candidate Donald Trump at first apologized, but then followed up with questions over whether the tape had been altered. In a later incident, even with incontrovertible video evidence of President Trump saying to Lester Holt in an NBC interview that he had fired James Comey due to concerns about the Russia investigation, Trump later suggested that Holt might have fudged the tape. Such feeble denials and assertions were widely dismissed in light of the audio and video evidence. But what's going to happen on the day when deep fake technology is improved and ubiquitous? One understands that here, too, the ricochet effect will be prevalent. It's ironic that with each new advance in technology, our trust in media may erode further. Thus, with deep fake audio and video, just as with text or picture information, the danger is not just that we'll be confronted with fraudulent material, but that the mere existence of widespread fakes could cause us to doubt whether anything can be trusted. Once again, Hannah Arendt provides the parallel with our past and frames its danger for an authoritarian future. Quoting Arendt, in an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and that nothing was true. The totalitarian mass leaders based their propaganda on the correct psychological assumption that under some conditions, one could make people believe the most fantastic statements one day and trust that if the next day they were given irrefutable proof of their falsehood, they would take refuge in cynicism." End quote. Thus, we see that the danger of fake news isn't merely that it leads you to believe in something that's false, but that if it gets bad enough, it can cause you to question whether anything is true at all. I'm going to close here with Orwell, of course. Near the end of my favorite book, George Orwell's 1984, there's a scene in which Winston Smith is being tortured in the basement of the Ministry of Love. Remember, the Ministry of Truth is where they lie to you, the Ministry of Love is where they torture you. Winston's being tortured because he insists on giving a truthful answer to the question, what's two plus two? With each correct response, Winston is given successively more electric shock by his teacher, O'Brien, until he's pushed to the edge of a insanity. Quoting 1984, how many fingers, Winston? Four, stop it, stop it, how can you go on? Four, four. How many fingers, Winston? Five, five, five. No, Winston, that's no use, you're lying. You still think there are four. How many fingers, please? Four, five, four. Anything you like, only stop it, stop the pain. Abruptly, he was sitting up with O'Brien's arm around his shoulder. He had perhaps lost consciousness for a few seconds. The bonds that had held his body down were loosened. You're a slow learner, Winston, said O'Brien gently. How can I help it, he blubbered. How can I help seeing what's in front of my eyes? Two and two are four. Sometimes, Winston, 
Sometimes they're five, sometimes they're three, sometimes they're all of them at once. You must try harder. It is not easy to become sane. That's it. Oh, that was such a depressing talk. I'm so sorry. On a beautiful sunny evening I know, in Cambridge, and I scared the hell out of everybody. But I think it's all stuff we need to hear. Uh, I mean, this is the implications are huge, and they're important, and people have to step up and realize that. So just rewinding the tape a little bit on the history of how we got to be here, you have uh, an interesting trajectory of fake news in the book, and you talk about first the kind of demise of traditional media, and then you talk about the kind of rise, the ascendancy of talk radio, the Rush Limbaugh's, mm -hmm. that kind of allowed everybody to have their say. And that kind of opened the sluice gates to what we arrived at, which is now silos of separate information uh, with never the twain shall meet. So can you talk a little bit uh, briefly yeah. about that? So yes, in the, in the book, in Post-Truth, I talk about uh, five roots of post-truth. Uh, one is science denial, which I think created a blueprint, a roadmap mm. for, for post-truth. The other is the decline of um, traditional media, the rise of social media, postmodernism, and cognitive bias. Okay? So if you think about what's happened in the media uh, over the last several decades, uh, you're right. We've become fragmented. We've uh, gone into different silos. And the danger there is, I think, the erosion of trust. Uh, I think that really, if you need to explain it, what's happened in the last uh, uh, several years is that we're no longer getting our information from the same sources. And we're no longer trusting one another's alternative sources of information, which means that we don't agree on a common body of fact. And then it's very easy for someone to claim that any, uh, any uh, pushback on factual claims is instead just political. It's instead just partisan. Now, I have to say that part of this was prefigured by postmodernism. And most of my hate mail comes from postmodernists, though uh, closing fast uh, science deniers uh, these days. Um, but that, that, that's, a, uh, that's a, a scary thing. And I think what happens on um, cable news, on, uh, on talk radio, is that uh, it, it further fragments us. It creates this sort of uh, identity that we're the people who believe in climate change, we're the people who don't believe in climate change. We're the people who believe it rained on Trump's inauguration, we're the people who don't. These are factual matters. There don't need to be two sides to a factual matter, and yet media has created it that there are. Um, in the book, you um, use lots of pithy examples, such as the one you raised, um, uh, and, and definitions of truth and post-trust, post-truth. Um, last week, um, James Comey wrote a really in interesting editorial, and he called out Trump for his rants and his lies. And he said, in normal times, it's healthy to believe the president of the United States, but when the president is a liar, who doesn't care what damage he does to vital institutions like the FBI, we must constantly return to the stubborn facts. So how do we arrive at a place where people trust their feelings over the facts? I, I, I think that's actually how post-truth is defined. The, when the Oxford Dictionaries named post-truth the word of the year in uh, November 2016, but before the election, by the way. Mm. Uh, it was defined as uh, putting feeling, uh, feeling before fact, I think was the, uh, the formal definition of it. Uh, part of the explanation for that is that we all, all of us, have wired in cognitive biases. We have these pathways in our brain that make us want to believe certain things. And it's very easy to succumb to these because they feel a lot like thinking, even though, because they provide an answer for us. Um, Daniel Kahneman wrote that uh, terrific book, Thinking Fast and Slow. That's the fast part of thinking. The slow part of thinking is when, more like science, you say, wait a minute, does what I want to believe jibe with the facts? And that takes some effort. That, that takes some, uh, some time to be able to do, and some commitment to be able to do that because it's very easy to succumb to cognitive bias. What makes it easier is if we can find other people who agree with us. Mm. 
And this is, I think, also what's happened to science denial in recent years. But thinking back to my childhood, I remember being really surprised when I was a boy when my mom told me that there were some people who thought that we hadn't gone to the moon. Well, but you'd never met one, you'd never heard them speak, but they're out there now and you can find them easily on Google. And so if you think that we haven't been to the moon, you can find that community, you can find that tribe and have your alternative view reinforced and create more fragmentation. So this is what's happened with anti-vax, this is what's happened with climate change, with flat earth, with anti-evolution. As I said, people are now getting their information from people who agree with them. Uh, and that reinforces uh, bad ideas. It's very hard. By the way, it's hard um, no matter what your political persuasion is. It's very hard not to believe something that you want to believe to be true. And so one thing that I talk about in Post-Truth, how to fight against this, how to fight against fake news, is a, um, a curriculum that, that uh, is actually being uh, was taught to fifth graders in California about how to identify fake news. But there's also a terrific program at the Alan Alda Center up at uh, Stony Brook, which is training uh, journalists and also training scientists uh, in, in how to fight back against this. So there, there are things that we can do. But one point I make in the book is the main way to fight post-truth is to fight it in ourselves. Don't, don't think of post-truth as something that happens to other people. It can happen to us too. Okay, um, we were talking about the quality and commitment of the actual journalistic profession, which used to be very honorable and has been kind of debased by Trump. Yeah. Um, so at a time when really good news organizations have dramatically reduced their staff locally and globally, and then you have the, uh, in addition to which, you've got this rapid dissemination of information via yeah. the internet, there's no time, when I was a journalist, you check things, there would be a time lapse, you know, there'd be 24 or 48 hours to check something out. Now it's instantly yeah. on the internet. So people are making assumptions without any journalistic framework or filters or analysis. So there's two things actually gravitating yeah. against the lack. So do you have a very depressing sort of forecast for the future of information in the well, democracy? I, I'm very hard on some aspects of the news media in the book, but I, but I want to make it clear. I think that the news media as a whole, the folks who adhere to the good journalistic values that I talked about in my talk, are the truth tellers. They're part of what is going to save us from this, okay? Um, because, to, you know, to have the integrity, again, to say, I need to get a double sourcing. I need to disclose conflict of interest. I need to fact check. I think that's very important. So no matter how much they're denigrated by politicians or others who want to claim that what they're doing is fake, uh, I've been actually quite encouraged by the extent to which the news media has insisted on going forward with their work. I think there are things that they get wrong. I think that when they have split screen debates on scientific topics, where they'll present a scientist on one side and somebody with a website on the other and pretend that everything is equal, that's false equivalence. That is not the way to report factual information. You sometimes see this uh, about other sorts of debates. Um, the uh, psychologist George Lakoff has uh, recommended that when, you, when the news media has to report on a lie, rather they should call it out as a lie but create what he calls a truth sandwich. Um, say what the truth is, report the lie, and then report, uh, I, you know, the, the other bun, right? <laughs> Re report the, uh, the, the, how the, what the person was seemingly trying to do with the lie in light of the truth, okay? So that the, the reader, the listener, the audience is never confused about what the truth is. Because if you just report the lie, then the lie has traction. And so I think that that's something that journalists have actually gotten a little bit better on now. You heard them going to the thesaurus for everything they could possibly say other than that Trump was a liar. He was mm. mendacious, he was uh, dissimulation, uh, uh, misleading. They would say anything but to say that he was a liar. And yet, he is 10,000, what is it, 10,000 now that the Washington Post uh, has called out. Lying is when you say something untrue intentionally uh, and we give them a chance and, and call it out over and again. So I think that uh, the, the media 
I, I don't actually have a dark forecast for the media. And here's an important lesson. If you believe in the values, and I'm not going for cheap applause here, I really believe this. If you believe in the values of truth-telling, fact-checking, good journalistic values, pay for the subscription. Mm. Do not rely on free news on the internet. Pay for the subscription. That's very important. I was about to, that was my next question. People will put all sorts of money away and all sorts of stuff but are they willing to pay for information they can trust? Because that's the only way you can get information you can trust now. I, I read in the newspaper the other day that um, it, there was a, a study done on climate change and, and an overwhelming number of people now, I can't quote the number off the top of my head, but an overwhelming number of people are concerned about climate change. But then when they ask these same people who said they were concerned if they would be willing to give $10 a month to fight it, most of them said no. People don't spend money on their values, uh, and it's, it's sort of shocking uh, to, to find this. I mean, in some cases, it's because they don't have, have a lot of money, and I have to look at the poll and see how the question was asked, but that was a sort of a shocking uh, finding to me. Um, also, the speed thing. Today, Science reported that uh, false news, fake news, travels six times faster than the truth. That's incredible. Well, we, we knew that already, right? A lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets its pants on. What was I mean, that, Mark and Twain? And Twitter's largely responsible for that, it yeah. said. So people have got to be more cognizant of where they're, how they're using social media. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a philosopher, and I, I believe in critical thinking and skepticism. And when you look at the curriculum that Scott Bedley uh, developed uh, for his fifth grade class in California, uh, he's teaching these fifth graders how to be critical readers, how to, when they look at a story that seems too good to be true, to ask, is it copyrighted? What's the source? Does it have an author listed? What else has the author listed? Uh, what else uh, does the source publish? I mean, these are easy steps. Even a fifth grader can do it, right? Uh, but these are easy steps, and you have to ask yourself how many of us do it. The challenge today is that our news media are presented to us, for most of us, electronically. And it can be very difficult to tell what's a reliable source or not. Um, one, one thing that happened to me when I was, uh, when I was little I remember going to the grocery store and seeing the national, uh, seeing some scandalous headline and asking my mom, uh, you know, look, is that true? And she said, oh, that's a national inquiry. You know, it's just lies, don't believe it. And I wondered, well, you know, how, how can they do this? You know, how is that possible? And, you know, mom, you haven't even read the story. How do you know that it's false? Well, imagine, and I was just in my uh, hometown grocery store the other day, and there's the national inquiry, same place it always was, okay? Uh, imagine if you bought the National Enquirer, the paper copy, and the paper copy of the New York Times, and you cut out the stories, and then you mix them up, and then you uh, fix the font electronically and presented them as a collage. That's how we get our news these days. And you couldn't tell at a glance which was the reliable source and which wasn't. And I think it's up to us. It's not just up to the journalists. It's up to us to be critical readers of, of news. Well, I'd like to invite people up to the... Um microphone to pose their questions. I have a question about your definition requiring intentionality. Okay. If you've ever known a pathological liar, they do actually believe what they're saying. And I think it's perfectly plausible that the Donald also believes the things that he's saying. Yeah. Um, mm. The conspiracy theorists that have been with us for quite some time, many of them also um, sincerely believe what they're purveying. So um, mm -hmm. I guess I'm a little concerned about defining it so very narrowly based on intention. So if you could talk a little more about sure. that. Sure. Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, I, I read a, a terrific book on the topic of delusion and self-delusion by Robert Trivers. It's called The Folly of Fools. And he makes the point that the best way to delude somebody is first to delude yourself. Okay, um, and there, there's experimental, he's a scientist, there's experimental evidence for this. Now, so the question becomes this, and this is why it's so hard, I think, why the media uh, was so reluctant to make the first claim of lying, because if it's intentional, you don't know what's in somebody's head, you don't know whether they believe it or not. I guess my criteria would be this. Is the person who's telling you the falsity telling it to you because they want to convince you 
versus they're telling you something that they think is true. Now, again, that's still a little opaque, and I, and I understand the, the nature of the question, but I guess the, the issue that I'd have is, I, I'm not so sure I agree with you that uh, about Trump's lies being based on delusion. I mean, in, in some cases they, they may be, um, but I think that there's a, there, at some level he must know that some of the things that he's saying are false, otherwise he wouldn't be trying to manipulate people into believing them, because they're so completely partisan, they're so completely, you know, all one way, that it makes me suspicious that it could just be based on, on delusion. But um, I'll, I'll think about that a little more, because it would be handy to be able to define post-truth a little bit uh, more broadly. I think. In the book, I define it as the political subordination of reality, which I guess would also include delusion. But, you know, I'll, I'll, here's an example from science. Um, years ago in South Africa, uh, President Mbeke uh, made the argument that um, HIV didn't cause AIDS and that it couldn't be treated by AZT or other uh, uh, drugs. And so he recommended that um, this was part of a Western plot, this was a conspiracy, and that it should be instead treated with garlic and lemon juice. 300,000 people died. Now, did he actually believe that or not? In some ways, it hardly matters, I suppose, because it, it, was, it was so devastating. I mean, was he deluded or was he intentionally lying? It, it, it sort of hard, hardly matters uh, at that point. I'll have to think of it, uh, what you said a little bit more. It's a good question. But the outcome is devastating. I think that's the important The outcome is devastating either, either way. Uh, and one thing that I note in the book is that denial, people don't, denialists are created. They start out with being ignorant, then they become willfully ignorant, and then they become denialists when they've repeated the, the willful ignorance, the lies, so often that they start to believe it themselves. That's, that's very dangerous, and pretty much you can't bring them back from that. But one reason that I think that we need to intervene and stand up for the truth is because every lie has an audience. And if you don't challenge the lie or the delusion, whatever it is, if you don't challenge it, then other people will go down that same path. And that, I think, is very dangerous. You're, you're, you choose a, a more, uh, I think, a more religious uh, um, position than a philosophical one. I try to explain, because uh, I know that uh, may seem not a, a good sentence. You, you're saying that my position is religious? Yes. Uh, okay. Because, uh, uh, and uh, I, I try to understand, because I know that it's not, uh, it's not uh, a, a, a good thing to do to a, to a philosopher. Okay. Right? Uh, so, uh, we uh, are surprised about uh, uh, Trump lied, lies. Okay, but uh, uh, we, we all know that the West history starts with a lie, with the uh, uh, Trojan, uh, Trojan uh, horse, okay? And uh, then yeah. in, uh, we, we all know, even if uh, it's not uh, correct to say, that uh, all politics in the history uh, sometimes lied to us. Okay? Yeah, yeah let, let, me, let me, I think I've got the gist of the question, though. Let me, let me try to answer it. Um, in an earlier book called Dark Ages, I make the argument that religious ideology did to natural science what political ide ideology is today doing to the social sciences, and then now also to, to science in general. Whether it's religious or political ideology, um, I don't think that ideology really has, has a role on factual questions. So when it comes to empirical questions, when it comes to in questions about truth or falsity, right or wrong, um, I'm very much opposed to the idea that, that ideology has a role. Um, religious beliefs can have a role for uh, values for some people for in the normative context, but I don't think that it actually has a role in deciding questions of right and wrong uh, of, of this type. I'm, I'm somewhat surprised to hear you say that you thought that I had a, had a religious perspective. Uh, maybe we can talk about it a little more after. Hi. I completely agree about that trust really um, is an important factor in, in um, whether we uh, respect the credibility of a news, uh, quote, news or story. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of an insight that when I was um, a recent college graduate, I was watching a presidential debate, 
And I had not followed po politics very much at all and, and haven't formulated opinion on economics and whatnot. And each side of them presented statistical facts and, 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 and sounded quite persuasive. And I realized that I was taking a liberal perspective because that's what my professors seemed like to do. That's what my friends were doing. And I realized that, that I was making my decisions based on people I trusted. Um, yep. mm. And uh, you know, even though I, you know, I, I went to a, a good school, and I, but yet at the same time, like, I, I, I gauged uh, who knew more than I did at one level, and then they gauged um, who knew more than they did. So I felt it was a form of laddering up in terms of credibility source. So like, if I, if I trusted my professors to give me a framework for something, and the professors trusted some news sources, and I felt that those news sources would be credible because I didn't, at the highest level, I didn't, I couldn't distinguish the facts as and whatnot. So I realized yeah. that. Mm. I mean, I guess I, I knew kind of ahead of time that in, eventually what, what's You're, come to terms is, I mean, come to fruition now is that we're in an age of who do you trust. You're um, thinking about it in exactly the right way. I like the fact that you're being self-critical and wondering, you know, am, am I engaging in this uh, as, as well as other people? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's really the, the first step to uh, combating uh, uh, post-truth. Um, it, it is okay to recognize at some level, though, as I was saying before, that there is such a thing as false equivalence. There is such a thing as wondering whether well, it's, it's just all equal and everybody does it. It is true that we all have the same cognitive biases built in, but those can be fought. Uh, compare, for instance, um, something I talk about in my new book is called The Scientific Attitude. I make the argument in the book that the scientific attitude is the opposite of post-truth because the scientific attitude is demonstrated where scientists not only care about evidence, but they they're open to the idea that new evidence can change their mind. Hmm. That's a very important factor, okay? If one's an ideologue, they're not allowing new information to change their mind. But if they're open to new information changing their mind, I think that's, that's a great thing. Trust, of course, we have to have trust because we don't know everything. But it is also important to be skeptical enough to be able to say, it is should I change my mind based on new information, not to be closed closed off about it? Yeah, and I want to add to that point that like when I was thinking about that, that I didn't know this kind of facts. I started realizing that people often cared very much whether they trusted a politician. So yep. they looked to their values more. For example, I feel that like say abortion rights, something that has really like motivated two sides of the political base. It's something that you don't need a lot of facts to have an opinion, to have a moral opinion That's on right. that decision. And because of that, I felt that people used that to then decide who do they trust. And with that trust comes a body of information mm. that, that made them more you, inclined, with just like just climate change. Yeah. For example, I think with climate change, what underlies that distrust of the science is the science that they come distrust because of creationism. Like they thought that the science that attacks creationism can, like why should I trust that if you're attacking my creationism? But, but it then impacts, it then becomes, you know, something that they right. extend to, like I don't trust these because they have a, mo you know, they have a, a political motivation to, to uh, and it's, yeah. it's interesting because um, there's been some work to show that people actually base their, even their empirical views on identity, on values. Um, and so we're mixing up the normative with the positive there. Um, we can certainly, I think it was Tip O'Neill who said, you're entitled to your own opinion but not your own facts. <laughs> it's certainly fine for people to have political disagreements over values questions, but, and which can be informed by factual matters. But the facts are the facts. So we could disagree over whether we thought that the death penalty was moral. We, we could have a values debate about that. What we should not have a debate about is the, the fact of whether the death penalty deters crime or not. And yet if you look at the literature, it's shot through with politics. It's shot through with ideology in a way that we would never tolerate in physics. We'd never tolerate in the natural sciences. The, uh, the literature on immigration, on guns, on the death penalty, the social sciences in general are just shot through with ideology, which makes it very difficult to, to untangle uh, this. But I think the um, problem is that, that a lot of those stats, they're coming from different sources, and people, if they're 
that will that will support whatever view they want to because of how they frame that question. So I, I think, think you're that, right. So which is why I, I've noticed in news sources that like CNN, they're starting to like focus more on introducing you to the journalists, their lives. You going back to the days of Walter Conkright or the news anchors of days where you Tr have very trust few is news an important so trust is that. an important part of it. I'd like to follow okay. up afterward with sure. with you as well. It's an interesting question. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, thank you again for shining a light on this really important uh, Thank topic. you. Um, to add to your list of um, recommendations of, that, uh, of, of things that people should uh, um, uh, take a look at, uh, University of Washington has a fantastic course called Calling Bullshit, Data Reasoning in a Digital World. <laughs> I love it. Um, I wish I could take that bit? course. And actually, I uh, use that material. I teach machine learning uh, mm -hmm. or taught machine learning. Um, for um, MBA students, um, and I try to, you know, put in um, ethics and uh, reasoning um, uh, Very about good. Uh, the data uh, that is generated and the algorithms because it could potentially uh, act as an amplifier for bias. Um, but my question is about the, an international angle to, to your point of view here. So um, this concept of other countries interfering in our democracy is an old concept. There's a great uh, uh, video series by the New York Times uh, about the 1980s uh, Russian operation infection um, where they laid out a seven um, a step process about how to create uh, untruths um, mm -hmm. uh, or lies. Um, uh, China's doing it as well. Um, the US has done it to other countries yep. as well. So um, does that add to the complexity or to uh, the um, tools that we ought to have at our disposal? Um, is it purely an individual responsibility uh, or can there be an yeah. ecosystem that could help? Yeah, that's, that, I mean, I like that question because it, there is a history to this. And if you think of uh, what they used to call it psychological warfare or information mm -hmm. warfare, when, you know, during wartime, one side would, you know, drop leaflets with false information. I mean, there, there are all sorts of um, lies that go on in wartime as, as, a, as a tool of war. I want to draw a distinction between one, not to, not to condone it in wartime, but I want to draw a distinction between nations doing that to other nations during wartime and politicians doing it to their own citizens. Um, or to one another within, within their, their nation. Because it's, to me, it feels scarier to have the information, uh, to, you know, to have psychological warfare, to have information warfare, whatever you want to call it, happening um, in, in our own country uh, to, to our own citizens. Mm -hmm. And I guess one reason I think this is because I'm an American and I believe that... Um, I believe in the First Amendment, and I think that uh, it, facts and information is very important to the lifeblood of democracy, and when that's compromised, I, I think that that's a, a very dangerous thing. Um, it's a longer discussion whether a nation that values that should violate it in fighting against another nation. My dad's a World War II veteran and told stories sometimes about the leafleting and you know, other things that happened along those lines. Um, but again, as a tactic of politics, of domestic politics, I think we're on new ground. I agree 100% with you uh, there. My point was, as a recipient of information, whether it's from our politicians or uh, implanted by a foreign um, country, mm -hmm. um, the mechanisms are the same for generating the untruth, it seems. I is the mechanism the same? I'm assuming it is the same. Um, I, I think, I don't know, I'd have to think about that a little more. I, I would think it is. Uh, I mean, I, I would think that there is a, a sort of a, a training that you could undergo um, for, uh, you know, combating something like that. I have my dad's old manual, the SEER manual, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape, in case you're taken prisoner. And I'd have to look back at it. I don't remember whether it had something on 
how to resist psychological or information warfare. But, but I'll bet there is some sort, of, uh, some sort of training. And that would actually be very interesting to look up. I'm glad you mentioned it because that would be very interesting to look up and see if some of those principles apply for fake news uh, and, and such. Thank you, that's a great Thank question. You. Thank you, first, for your very scary presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm a <laughs> professor of communications media at Fitchburg State, and so I've been thinking about this from the pedagogical perspective, and I just want to follow up on a couple things you said. Sure. Really briefly. Um, first, the, the kind of fifth grade fact-checking perspective. I think my concern there is uh, that, that is, that's quickly, um, people who are producing the news are going to catch up to that. So even in the 2016 election, we know the Russians created like a blackmatters.us site that had a lot of that. It had copyright information. It had lots of articles that had yeah, authors. Yeah, it's not foolproof. You're right. The second, I think, maybe the deeper concern I have, and, and this is following some of what Dana Boyd has argued from a media studies perspective, is uh, that, that a lot of the media literacy training that we have, is, especially in K through 12, where it does exist, teaches, yep. I think along the lines of what you're saying, and critical, critical thinking and analysis, but in large, students are coming away from this thinking how everything has bias in it. And to me, that yes. sounds a lot like what you said about uh, not thinking there are any truth tellers in the world. So yeah. I'm wondering what we can do from that pedagogical or educational perspective that will help us, but not help us so much that we doubt absolutely everything. It, it, it's, I, I love that. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. It sort of reminds me of the way that we do science training for elementary students. We never treat, teach them about the process of science. We teach them about the result. And so they have this uh, um, great respect for the authority of scientists because, you know, look, they always discover truth because they don't tell us about any of the failures, right? But in media literacy training, they almost do the opposite. They tell us, beware, 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 everything could be fake, and they don't really teach us uh, what to trust. So I think that that's an important point, that in media literacy training, we need to learn not only the marks of fake, but also the, the marks of authenticity, the, the, um, that it's okay to trust when you have reason to trust. And the example that I use here, again, I'm thinking about these days because my new book is on science, is scientists. Scientists trust one another. Scientists, don't, as smart as they are, don't know everything about everything. And we trust scientists. Why do we trust scientists? Because we understand the rigor of the process that they've gone through to find their information. So I fly on airplanes, but I don't know how a jet engine works. And I use the internet, but I'm not really sure I could explain how that works either. I trust that there are right and wrong answers that someone knows and that they'll be based on factual accounts. Now, why do, why do I feel that? It's not just partisan, okay? It's, it's not... Uh, normative. It's, uh, it has to do with my respect for the, uh, for the values of science. And so I think that if what we taught in media literacy is not just look out for this, look out for that, but taught them the values of journalism, taught them why it's important to uh, have conflict of interest disclosed, you know, why it's important to double source, you know, talk about some of the cases where we got into trouble when we didn't double source or when we didn't disclose a conflict of interest, et cetera, et cetera. I think that could train them uh, in how to do it. That is not to just be consumers of news, but how to create it. So maybe they're going to be the next generation of journalists, and they need to have those values instilled in them. In the same way that in graduate school, scientists have the values instilled when they really learn science that you know, this is what you need to do in order to have your work taken seriously. You need to always ask, how do I know I'm not wrong? The journalist always has to ask, am I really sure that I know what I think I know? If we taught that to students, I think that would be the greatest thing that we could do for media literacy. Terrific question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure this question is on your radar, but I'll try it. Uh, what's your take on the case of Julian Assange? Is he a, is he a, a hero in the <laughs> guise of Daniel Ellsberg, or is he a you know information? Uh, is he is he a truth and teller? What should be yeah. and what will and how will his case be adjudicated uh, here in the United States when he's extradited? Okay, so uh, thank you for the question. I, I actually 
I wish I knew more about the case, but I'm, I'm not going to fudge. I'm going to answer. But I'm going to say this. We don't know yet, but I suspect that Julian Assange is doing what so many science deniers do, which is that they're cherry picking. I think that Julian Assange is disclosing truth in some cases. He's leaking documents that are factual documents. But he's doing so in a selective way, such that it creates a, mission, a misimpression. He's doing it with a political purpose, which is not what a truth teller would do. Okay? So if he's um, just a whistleblower, that's one thing. But to blow the whistle only selectively about the things that you want to blow the whistle about, I think that's partisan. So when you ask me, is he a truth teller, it's the same as saying, you know, is a, uh, is a climate change denier who relentlessly cherry picks, you know, the one or two facts that they think make their case and only talk about those, do they care about evidence? I have to say no, because although they're presenting me with some facts, they're doing so within a dishonest context. How do you resolve information silos when people don't agree on facts? Is there hope for it? I mean, things seem very emotionally charged. Uh, it's hard. Uh, it's hard because uh, people do form factual beliefs sometimes based on identity, uh, based on emotion. Um, I faced this most recently when I went uh, for research for my next book. I went to the uh, Flat Earth International Conference in Denver in November 2018. Wow. So for professional reasons, for my interest as, some, as a philosopher of science who studies science denial, I wanted to see what they said. My friends all warned me that they didn't really believe this, that this was just a goof. And I'm here to tell you, they did really believe it. And so uh, I faced ex exactly this question, which was, you know, how did we get so far away from one another that this sort of thing could happen? Yeah. Uh, what I did, I, I read some literature, some psychological literature, maybe some of the same things that you've read, by James Kuklinski and David Redlosk, and some work by uh, Brendan Nine, who's a political scientist, talking about how people change their minds. Okay, so, you know, th there are these uh, scary articles in The Atlantic and The New Yorker in the last few years uh, called Why Don't Facts Change Our Minds? And I wondered, right. is there any context in which facts could change our minds? Right. And what the literature seems to show, the experimental literature, is that people will change their minds if you can build trust. And trust is built through one-on-one -on -one interaction. Okay, The worst way to do it um, is on the internet. Okay, The best way to do it is face-to-face, -face, which is why I went to the Flat Earth Convention. Now, I can't say that I changed anybody's mind, but I was there for two days. I spent the first day with my mouth shut, wearing the badge, listening. But I spent the second day, as a philosopher, telling them I was a philosopher, not challenging them on the evidential basis for their belief, because the evidence has been around for 2,300 years. They knew the evidence, and they rejected it. That was not going to convince them. Instead, I asked them a philosophical question, which was, um, what evidence would it take to prove to you that you were wrong? So that, I wanted to challenge their critical faculties. Now, again, I'm not sure that built any trust, but I did take one of the guest speakers out to dinner, and we had a two-hour dinner. I paid for a conversation where I, I took their views seriously. I think they're wrong. This is what the story in Newsweek is about. I tell some of the stories there. Right. I, I think they're wrong, and I didn't hide that. But I approached them respectfully. I approached them calmly, because that's actually how you change people's minds. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Your talk was terrifying. I agree with everything you've said. Th thank um, you, I think. Being one of the younger members of the audience tonight, in 20 years' time, we're going to be seeing the uh, impact of our climate crisis. In terms of the misinformation that's going around climate change at the moment and kind of the divisions between the left and the right in both our countries and around the world, where do you see the next 20 years or the future heading? I know that you, you mentioned that we need to be smarter, journalists need to yeah. double source, we need to be able to reflect on our own biases and information, but where does that get us in the long run? And, and, and you mean, in general, do you mean on climate change in particular, or just on Yeah, something? yeah, we'll go with that example. I think that was why I started, yeah. 
Sorry. No, it's it's the it's the hardest question because I I can't I can't predict. Um, all I can say is that it feels to me to be a necessary step, though maybe it won't be a sufficient step, to begin to fight back now, not to wait. We're already seeing the effects of climate change. I think we're already seeing some of the pernicious effects of fake news on our political dialogue. I think that we're, we're beginning to pay the price in, in a lot of ways for our denialist post-truth culture. And unfortunately, given the way human beings act, it normally takes a crisis before we wake up about it. I am encouraged by the fact that in the latest poll, it showed that more people are now convinced over a very short period of time that climate change is real. I've read some very scary articles recently that you've probably read as well, which say that we need to get carbon emissions down by half by 2030 and down to zero by 2050 in order to keep us under the one and a half degree Celsius cap which is when, where most of the damage is, is going to be done above that. The frustrating thing is that we can actually do it. The technology exists to do it, but we lack the political will. Now, the way that Congress works, if you come to them and say, we've got a problem in 20 years, they say, come back in 19 years and tell us about it. This is not that kind of a problem. This is a problem that we need to work about. I think the people will lead on this. I think that leaders in, in Congress... Um, will listen to the people uh, if, if the people make this, uh, you know, something that they need to listen to. One last question, and then we have the book signing. Hello, thank you for coming and uh, speaking about this very important topic. I'm wondering, from a point of view of using the legal system uh, to incentivize or disincentivize people's inclination uh, to put out disinformation, yeah. um, currently, you know, to my knowledge, there's stuff about misrepresentation and fraud, but there's intentionality components of the, uh, of the mindset, but those could be gotten around by inferring what possible other use could you have for creating a whole story, Motive. if not to mislead. Um, but I'm just wondering, what do you think of, of the potency of the current laws and what, mm. what might be done in the future and whether anybody in Congress is talking about this. It, it's, it's a problem because I believe in free speech and it's a dangerous thing to begin to designate some speech as fake and some not because that can have a huge backfire effect depending on who's in power at what point. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of some of those sorts of solutions. Might it be analogized to screaming fire in a crowded theater uh, it, in the it, event it that could, there isn't it one? It could, if it were dangerous enough. And I mean, there have been examples of fake news that are like that. The uh, Comet Pizza story, uh, the, the, mm. the, the completely discredited conspiracy theory that uh, Hillary Clinton mm. was running a child sex ring out of the basement of a pizza restaurant mm. in Connecticut. Well, somebody took that story seriously, showed up and fired a shotgun. So, I mean, people can... There can be consequences. A little known other story was, uh, and I have the details of this in the book, I don't remember it as much well as I should, but there was, there was a, a, a fake news story which almost led to a nuclear confrontation between Israel and Pakistan a few years back. But it, was, but it was based on a fake news story, so there can be real consequences. So I understand that the, the incentive to say, the public's in danger, you know, we, we need to do something about it. What I, would, what I would much rather see is the outlets like Facebook and Twitter that are supposed to be policing this take the problem more seriously. They too are free speech advocates, but I think that in that case, it's somewhat corrupted by the fact that they're also making money on the speech. Um, compare it, uh, the, the example that I sometimes use is this. You, I, I have never met anyone who has inadvertently run across pornography on Facebook. And that is because Facebook polices for pornography. They have a team, a dedicated human team. It's not an algorithm. It's a team of people who get that stuff off there. They could do the same for anything that they decided to do, for fake news or, or whatever they decided to. Now, 
is there an algorithm to decide whether something's fake? Does it have to be done by a human being? Then it's subject to uh, the claim that it's partisan. I think we may be uh, headed for some sort of, especially with deep fake ne technology, okay. some sort of uh, a branding or label or, or like a watermark or movie, a watermark, right? Something that will that will allow us to do that. Like I said, you build a ten foot wall; they build an eleven foot ladder. But but it, it's a it's a race. Look at what's happened. This is maybe a, a crazy analogy, but with counterfeiting, every time the counterfeiters get better, they redesign the bills. Then the counterfeiters get better. Then they redesign the bills. It's this escalating, never ending race. But I, I think it, we, we can find a way to, to respond to it. The, the genie that probably can't be put back in the bottle is what Trump is talking about, changing the libel laws. Um, if we change the libel laws, I think then we're in big trouble. Mm. Because it, you look at the number of countries that have journalists in jail. Um, are, why are they in jail? Are they in jail because they're telling the truth? because they're telling something that's hostile to the government. That's a, that's a, a scary factor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we could go on and on, but um, I know that we want to get to the book signing, and um, I want to thank you, Lee, for thank you. A, and a very, very illuminating talk about post-truth and pseudoscience. Thank you.